All right, we are live. Uh, I am just going to go ahead and give a little bit of time for everyone to get uh, ready. I see we're getting that participant number is still going up. I'm just going to give it a second to kind of level off so no one misses our introduction. All right. Welcome to day two. Good morning to everyone. And I will just go ahead and get started right now. All right. Welcome. First, we would like to thank the sponsor of this session, Polygon. Polygon offers a complete range of services within the areas of temporary climate solutions, document recovery, and emergency drying solutions. Uh, thank you. Slide. All right, then. Now, much like the fictional Agent MacGyver, when an archivist finds themselves in a tight spot, they have to use whatever resources are at hand. And while he might get out of a scrape with a literal shoestring, a creative archivist can do wonders with a shoestring budget. Uh, I and my five wonderful co-presenters will each be presenting the ways we've MacGyvered the archives in our own institutions. Uh, slide, please. Oh dear, it looks like there's been a problem. I did review the slides before we started, but oh, I saw that. There we go. Thank you. What's a presentation without a little blip? Uh, we begin with someone at the beginning, both in the career and the stage of the archive. The spring conference actually marks one full year that I've been working in archives. I am in my first job right out of my master's program. And uh, of course, while that program did cover some aspects of archival work, it was a library and information study degree. And so, of course, this job tasked me with the organization of an archives program, uh, whole cloth. Now, I work at VCOM. VCOM is a medical school that has only existed for 20 years, but in that time, it has expanded to four campuses. Um, each campus's library has a small staff. Virginia, I'm one of three full time staff members and the other campuses also have two to three full time staff. I work at the oldest campus up here in Virginia, but each campus has its own history and things they would like to have preserved unique to their region. Uh, therefore, the framework I'm building needs to be not only reproducible, but highly adaptable and the more low tech and low budget, the better. Uh, next slide, please. In those 20 years of VCOM's existence, our library has slowly collected items that could constitute parts of an archive, but without any of the required structure. Uh, honestly, the best way to describe its state at the beginning last year would be nebulous. And much like the nebula pictured here, our library had enough material for it to become something, but without shape and order, those materials aren't an archive. Uh, and most importantly, they cannot be used to create value for our institution. Uh, so we have a lovely visual here. Next slide, please. All right, uh, with the next few slides, I've just taken photos to demonstrate the different forms and materials have been in. Uh, these are all uncatalogued and in a sort of perpetual limbo that low priority issues tend to find themselves in a busy library. Um, interestingly enough, each different physical grouping of where they were corresponded with how things would end up being divided at a collection level. Uh, it seems like this is fairly obvious, but for items that organically accumulated over two decades in a medical reference library with no thought for further archival or special collections, uh, it certainly is interesting how they were still almost instinctively kept separate. Uh, here on the left, our two bottom shelves used to be a resource for contemporary Appalachian rural health information. It stopped being part of the general collection almost 15 years ago, but those shelves were never cleared. And now, uh, here in the 2020s, they have actually sort of aged into a very valuable little snapshot of our institution's early days in the early 2000s. Um, with all of the relevant 2000s healthcare reforms that were going on. So just by sitting there, they aged like a fine wine. Uh, and on the right, in contrast, this is the most well-contained of the groups. Here, in terms of physical space, form took the place of function when it came to organization. And honestly, it has not done a bad job of it purely because this one donation happened to entirely fill a cabinet. This is the only uh, group of antique volumes that 
I know the extent of it being one donation from one person. So just by virtue of it being held within one cabinet, this is the one that I actually know the complete provenance of. Um, next slide, please. Now, in contract to those two fairly well-defined ones, uh, these are examples of the wide variety of vintage and antique medical texts that have taken up residence in our work corner. As you can tell just from those spines, there's a huge range here from some 1990s uh, radiology books to a wonderful complete set of 1920 Oxford medical volumes. Uh, barring some unforeseen super meaningful provenance that jumps out in the next stage of organization, this is probably going to be managed more as a special library collection, but I can't make those decisions without that history that's going on to the next portion. Um, it's been actually the big, one of the biggest challenges has been balancing my librarian brain with the archival principles and practices I have been familiarizing myself with in the last year. Next slide, please. When I was onboarding, I was introduced to our officially archived portion that we had been actively treating as such. As you can see, it's made up of archival quality boxes with folders very neatly labeled. And I initially assumed, oh, this portion is, this is done. I don't need to do any work on this. Uh, instead, it has proven to be the cautionary tale of what can happen when we're overwhelmed with not having enough funding, not having enough uh, resources and we don't set up formal procedures, policies, workflows. That part may be the driest and most overwhelming part of the work, but it is the most important. It has to exist, even if it's just a, a binder. Um, these were begun by a predecessor who had archival training, but things like formal planning and record keeping weren't established by the time she moved on. Um, the next person came in, had one piece of paper explaining the file naming. They did their best repeat uh, for 15 years. And um, as you can see in these photos, most um, noticeably on the right, uh, turned out multiple items need to be uh, assessed for rehousing as soon as possible. Um, that poor folded up bit right there, that is our original blueprint. So this actually, the neatest part actually turned out to be the part that needed the most work. Um, and it's very interesting. While this may have interest, this has started as an organic collection. These boxes are currently being managed as somewhere between an artificial collection and simply active record keeping for the institution. So that lack of continuity actually destroyed what originally was a like a pretty good organic collection. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have a very underwhelming example of how I decided to deal all of this with all of this with my shoestring budget. We had no additional funding. Um, everything had to come out of our already minimal library funding. Um, this is simply an itemized list of each item from a rural health corner of our general collection I showed you all earlier. I just created itemized lists, then color coded with highlighters to get a rough sense of what the nature of each collection was. It's very inelegant, but it proved to be the most important stuff to step to start making definitive shapes out of everything. I needed to just sit with my list and my favorite highlighters before I could bring a report to the head librarian with a digestible report of what we had and where we could go in the future. Um, and this process was used for all of the materials I've gone over to prove most helpful for the archival boxes. All right, next slide. I'm sure you might all you might have been thinking, I hear all I'm hearing is what you don't know. Um, here's just an example of the records that I have been working with. Um, it's, a, it's a great gift form for um, donations to our, our uh, reference library, not so much for formal accession purposes and record keeping. Um, honestly, a, lo a lot of this has been a bit of an archaeological dig. Uh, next slide. So I have been doing all this work. A huge part has been educating myself and familiarizing myself with the best practices. Uh, but the next step in the organization is how to take that and save everyone the time that I went through for this. Um, I initially started thinking, oh, I need to flip the triangle because, you know, first thing we learn phones and as librarians, we do this, but that was not the uh, learning tool, the visualization that actually helped me explain it to my uh, fellow staff members. Uh, next slide. Um, you'll see some fairly uh, creative little doodles. Um, 
it has been um, answering what's the difference between how we treat our general collection as a whole and an archival one. It's the same word. It's collection. Um, I have had the best success explaining the difference between tree resin and fossilized amber. It's quite simple, but uh, it's effective. Something that is fluid versus something that is much more stasis and you don't go in and deal with things. So that's when it clicked for the other staff members. And just to round it out, I would like to next slide show you all my own inverted try. Oh, uh, unfortunately for time, we're going to have to skip this. This is just something that is um, dealing with how I'm proving um, the archives worth to the outside. Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to ask. But um, here's a the visualization, my own inverted triangle, pouring all of my work into a continuity resource binder. If I do this and do not put my reasoning in by um, it's by creating a record of my decision making and helpful resources, I'm setting a precedent that will ensure everyone else who works on archives at VCOMS will have to MacGyver things just a little bit less. All that, you'll see some Merrick resources up there. All of that is going into the white binder. All right, and I do believe my 10 minutes are about up, and so I will clear the floor. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Anne. All right, uh, much like Anne, uh, I also work at a university that's heavy in the health sciences. Uh, my name is Tara Wink. I'm the historical collections librarian and archivist at the University of Maryland, Baltimore in the Health Sciences and Human Services Library. Um, so a little bit about the University of Maryland, Baltimore. We are located downtown Baltimore, surrounded by businesses, very close to the Orioles, all of these amazing things that are an urban campus. Um, we were founded in 1807 as the College of Medicine in Maryland, um, and we trace our date to that. We trace our founding to that date, which makes us the oldest uh, University of Maryland campus in the state system of Maryland. Uh, we have roughly 7,000 students across seven uh, professional schools, so heavily professional studies and graduate studies, not many undergraduate. Uh, the HSHSL, or the Health Sciences and Human Services Library at UMB, is located right in the center of campus. Um, we serve six of the seven professional schools. We do have a law school which has its own library. And we are the oldest library on campus. Uh, our founding was in 1813 with the purchase of a medical collection from Dr. John Crawford, who happened to be one of our faculty. He passed away and his collection was deemed very valuable and worthy by the uh, faculty of the bank at the time. So we purchased it and that is where we trace our history. So we believe we could be the oldest uh, health sciences or a oldest library associated with a school of medicine in the country but it's hard to prove that. <laughs> so I'm sure all of you have these horror stories and these things that you find, um, but this is my story. Uh, I started at UMB in 2018. I was the only staff member in the department and the first professionally trained archivist. Um, so as you probably, many of you have started in similar roles, the collection was under the well-meaning care of librarians for many, many years prior to my starting date. Um, which meant that our book collections were in fantastic order um, and very well cataloged. However, our manuscript and archival stuff was looking a little bit like this. I found a lot of moving boxes, a lot of collections thrown together in one box, not knowing what collection, where one collection started and where one ended. Uh, so there was not a lot of physical control over the collection, let alone intellectual control. Uh, there's also lots, still lots of vertical files and collections being pulled together to make um, a library collection rather than um, respecting the archival order of things. Uh, finding aids, I put them in quotes because they were hardly finding aids. Uh, they seem to be more like container lists, as you can see on the left, um, with inventories, longer biographies, just descriptions of what was in the, in the filing cabinet rather than a finding aid. Um, the finding aid on the right is actually for the collection that I'm going to be using as the example for this presentation. However, it is for the book collection, which was not a collection created by Dr. Eugene F. Cordell. Um, instead, it was named after him, and I'll explain a little bit more about him in a minute. Um, but just 
interesting to note that the Cordago collection as described is not the actual manuscript collection that I'm going to be talking about. Um, it is a book collection that was named. So this is one of my favorite photos that I've ever taken of the collections. Um, the Cordell manuscript collection was found in this very archival box, um, also stating very valuable to be processed. Um, and you can see what it looked like when you open the box, lots of papers stacked together in those awful three ring binder um, scrapbooking type material, uh, not archival at all. At all. So a little context for the Cordell, Turner Cordell papers or collection. Uh, the Turner Cordell families are, were very wealthy, influential Southern families connected through ma the marriage of Dr. Levi O'Connor Cordell, who is a graduate of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and Christine Turner. Uh, the collection documents this family um, and their lives. They were, again, Southern, Southern families, so they were slave owners. There's information about their um, Leaves, as well as their businesses. Um, but the large portion of the, of the collection contains the papers of Christine Turner Cordell and Dr. Eugene F. Cordell, um, who was her son. Dr. Cordell was important to UMB because he was the first librarian. Um, he actually is a medical doctor and a graduate of the School of Medicine in 1868. However, he was the one responsible for organizing the library making it usable for people. Um, and actually we have him to thank for the rare collections and rare uh, books that we have. Um, he, his, the, again, the book collection was named after him in honor, to honor him um, as the first librarian. But he was a Confederate army, he was in the Confederate army and a large portion of the papers are his letters to his mother while in that war. Um, so much like Angus and MacGyver, I had to look around the library and campus to utilize what was there um, that was inexpensive. And thankfully, through early networking, I was able to actually get, and I still do get, free archival boxes. Yes, you heard that, free archival boxes from our School of Dentistry, or the National Museum of Dentistry, um, which, is on our, which is on our campus. And they, they had, um, deaccessioned and gotten rid of a lot of collections but still have these these boxes so they offered them to me and thankfully I was able to get these um, so I was able to house these in proper ways but I also have used things like Word, Excel, uh, Adobe and our UMB digital archive which is a DSpace platform and is actually hosted by a company called Atmire. Um, early on it made the decision not to pursue a installation or the purchase of an archival management tool like archive space. I just knew that I didn't have the time to really do this well and we didn't have the, the resources or meaning money or time to make it really work well for our institution. Plus I wasn't sure that the use of the collections warranted it. So I decided to use what I had available to me rather than try to um, go that route. So while this may not be the most archively sound thing, it has made things more accessible and people can use the materials. And you know, I try to go to bed at night thinking I've done the best that I can. Um, so we are putting our finding aids in our digital archive using these different tools and I'll describe how I'm using these tools. So first word, over time I have actually created a word a template for finding aids, which is what you're seeing on the left. Uh, these are all DAX compliant. Um, these are the ones I commonly use in our collections. When needed, I do add more um, and I do use more, but these are the general ones that tend to be the most um, important for us. Um, to the right, you're actually seeing what the what part of the, the Cordell uh, Turner collection and what it looks like. I made a probably not normal archival decision to go into intense detail about each of the family members that are in the collection. So our, the biographical history is rather long, but it, it does outline the different people who are in the collection and what their roles were within the family and why they are there. Um, so I also use Excel pretty excessively. This is a long list of the different letters that are in the collection. Um, common date, to who it's to, who it's from, the location. 
The notes are really for me. So when I'm writing the biographical history, I can take these notes and kind of describe what's in the collection for the, the scope and content note, as well as the biographical history. Um, this, these Excel spreadsheets are also in the final word doc or final signing aid, just smaller and, and cleaner. So here's a, the Adobe Photoshop, uh, not Photoshop, Adobe, Adobe Acrobat PDF version. Um, so we create the, a PDF out of the Word document, make it OCR uh, capable so that when you upload it, people can use it. Um, this also means that it cannot be edited once it's been uploaded to our digital archive. Here's their digital archive. Again, I said this is the um, what was existing when I started and the person who created it had the forethought to really create um, archival communities, one for each of the schools, um, and there is one for the finding aids. So this is where we decided to put our 20 existing finding aids right now and more as we go. Um, so there is a campus historical collections um, community. This is where our finding aids live. Um, there is, this is the Turner Cordell family finding aid. Um, as you can see, a PDF, a, a, a little image of the PDF is created and then there is metadata associated with. I will put a link to this particular collection in the chat, um, but I do have to cut it off here um, and just mention that there is a separate Cordell family collection which has digitized letters from the family in it as well. Um, so this has made one spot for all the Turner Cordell family papers and people can use them and find them on the World Wide Web. Here is my contact information. I am happy to discuss this more. As you can see, I certainly have a lot to say and I'm willing to talk more as needed. I'm going to turn it over to Scott now. Uh, my name is Scott Kiefer and I am the provincial archivist for the Daughters of Charity in Emmitsburg, Maryland, which is the repository for a community of Catholic sisters and their various works in the spiritual and corporeal worlds. Somewhere between those two worlds lies the digital world of digital preservation, which is what I would like to talk about today. Next slide, please. As some institutional background, we are funded directly by the community of sisters and are their formal archive. We are not affiliated or associated with a university or government institution. We are attached to a museum, but not a part of the museum. Uh, the community is incorporated under US law as a private nonprofit organization. Thus, we are a private religious archive that allows public access with some restrictions on certain materials by decree of our council. In other words, we do not have the same mission that an organization like a university library or a government repository does. Next slide. Born digital files started arriving in the mid 2000s and have only grown in volume since then. After about 2011, all records of the council and the overwhelming majority of documents related to things like official meetings and assemblies became born digital. This is in addition to sets of photographs, oral histories that were only recorded digitally and every other type of record that now consists of bits and bytes. Over time, they accumulated on a server with their location unrecorded and no record of their existence and remaining vulnerable to digital loss. We approached our IT department about this and uh, they gave us the assurance, oh, don't worry, we back up everything every night, um, which was not exactly what we wanted to hear. Um, and so our goal in all of this was to enact a digital preservation plan and start to put it in place uh, and due to cost and IT restrictions, a program like Preservica was not an option. Um, I will also say that this is 2020 um, and Preservica starter did not exist yet. So it really, really was not an option. Next slide, please. We used the NDSA levels of digital preservation as our guide through all of this. I'm sure uh, just like me, many of you have been told to think about where your institution lies on this scale. When we looked at our state of digital preservation, we found that in most categories, we were at a solid zero. I bring this up because I certainly have felt the pressure to you know, keep up with the archival Joneses. 
But the reality is that I'm sure there are a number of people in this virtual room who are also at zero in a good number of these categories. We did not have two complete copies in separate locations. We were not checking integrity of information. We were not documenting file formats. And a very small fraction of our digital records had useful metadata. Decidedly sat at a one was in delegating who had authority to our digital content. Next slide. Um, as an example of some of this digital content, I'd like to show a digital version of Terra's box of mystery, box of archival mystery. Um, a lot of our collections are organized by city. Um, I hope you can read what some of those say, but that's the um, Montreal, Canada collection. Um, and so in that digital file, there are photos which contain various access scans of physical materials in JPEGs um, that were made for researchers or ourselves for some reason. Um, a photo that's uh, photos, Sister Marie Raw's visit 2019, which are born digital files. Uh, no physical exists. They are in JPEGs, but at least the, their, the folder name has some useful information. We know exactly where that came from and why it's there. Uh, and one file that says translations, Nicole, which are translations of French documents into English for some reason. They are Word docs, and apparently Nicole did those. And no, I don't know who Nicole is. Uh, next slide, please. Our step one, as with many projects, was to do a survey. This was a COVID era remote access stay at home project where we went through each and every folder on the server and checked to see how much digital material there was. We were then able to detect patterns and set priorities for digital preservation, including top tier born digital materials with no physical analog alongside digitized AV materials that were on endangered formats, mid-level priorities of complete scans of materials that were sometimes up to preservation standard, sometimes they also weren't, and some lowest priorities, which were spot access scans or individual scans of documents or photographs. They were not complete collections, they were not even complete folders, and they were usually scanned as fairly generic names, histories, photos, something like that. Uh, next slide, please. In deciding what needed preserved, we noted the file path, the formats included in each location, what the material appeared to be as best we could figure out, and any other preservation comments. We decided that upper tier records would be marked for digital preservation measures up to the lowest NDSA levels. The lowest tier were not included at this time, and mid-level records were marked for later review for quality control, incomplete metadata, or other issues. Next slide. In terms of tools, we did convince IT to get us a cloud space that they determined was secure, which in our case was an Azure account. We were also looking for tools that we could run ourselves in the archives with minimal to no interference from our IT department. We set it on the program Fixity, which with a $50 a year subscription, yes, for $50 a year subscription, that's it, uh, it would allow us to set our calendars and run our own checksums. Uh, the program would help create the preservation metadata, which we could then store and track ourselves. We also purchased a few external hard drives and used those as the official third backup by a different method, which is one of the recommendations of the NDS NDSA. And next slide, please. Uh, that's an example of the start of one of the Fixity uh, scans. And so you can see there uh, it scanned, you know, 56,000 files or so. Uh, there were 64 that were moved or renamed and a few others that had changes or removed. Um, and so we could go and use that information to figure out what needed to happen or if something went wrong or if something uh, perfectly reasonable occurred. Um, and if we really, really needed to, we could pull from backup files as necessary. Next slide, please. After all of this experimenting, we were able to codify for the first time a digital preservation workflow with a review timeline in place to refine. We have begun to enter, to the, enter the descriptive metadata into our catalogs to make them findable and part of our collection. So those born digital photos from Montreal uh, there's actually an entry for them now. And so if you, you know, can search for Sister Marie Raw's 2019 visit, it is actually findable and discoverable now. Next slide. Uh, in terms of our goals of reaching NDSA level one, it averages out that way. 
um, we found that once we had completed these steps for our highest priority materials, we could reasonably say that at least regarding them, we had reached level one. We're still definitely refining our procedures, adding metadata, and reviewing mid-tier level records for determination, but we are able to sleep a lot better at night knowing that our most at-risk digital records have a base level of security. It's definitely an ongoing project and we will never be there the whole way, but this process provided us a level of security that we feel we are not threatened with an imminent digital apocalypse and there is no longer a digital ticking time bomb for us to diffuse as the archival MacGyvers. Um, that is the end of my section. So I believe that I will step aside and let Amy take the reins from here. Maybe hopefully. Okay, thank you all for bearing with me. Um, thanks, Scott. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Poe, and I'm the collections manager for the Military Women's Memorial. We preserve, honor, and tell the stories of military women's service to the nation with an emphasis on firsthand accounts. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the organization uh, just to put my uh, presentation in context. Uh, next slide, please. The Military Women's Memorial is a 501c3, which was authorized by uh, congressional legislation in 1983, but built through the fundraising and advocacy of service women, uh, many from the World War II era, who found themselves unrepresented by the monuments that are in the nation's capital. Although we sit on federal land, the memorial is supported entirely through private donations and grants, uh, which makes our work a formidable task. The memorial is built in the semicircular wall that you can see in my background here. It sits at the ceremonial entrance to Arlington National Cemetery, and the wall was left uncompleted in 1932 and selected as the site for the memorial. To create the exhibit gallery and event space that are inside, and you've got a snapshot of one of our gallery niches there, uh, there was excavation done behind the wall the memorial was completed and dedicated in 1997, and we are the only national repository that documents all military women's service. Our collections, some of which you see here, were established in 1994 when there was recognition that artifacts would be needed to fill the gallery space. A curator was hired in 1995, and this past October, the memorial celebrated its 25th anniversary. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our collections. Uh, they're comprised of more than 8,000 donations, including artifact and archival resources in a wide range of formats. We have textiles such as military service uni uniforms, flags, quilts, service memorabilia, original correspondence, scrapbooks, diaries, military orders, uh, personal and official photos dating from the Spanish-American War to the present day, and then a variety of aid me materials, um, some of which document the in institutional history of the creation of the memorial and our events over time, but also things like um, vinyl records, which recorded letters home to families from World War II and World War II era footage. Uh, the photo that you see here is our offsite storage. We don't have storage at the memorial proper or in our foundation offices. We partner with the History Factory in Chantilly uh, so that we can have climate controlled conditions for our collections. We also have an oral history collection of more than 1400 oral histories and growing. We also operate a small research library. So our collections are rich for research. They touch on a host of issues relating not just to military women's service, but women's societal standing advancement, racial integration and women's rights. Next slide, please. So while paper clips can instill dread and loathing in the hearts and minds of archivists, MacGyver saw them differently. And I had a laugh when I came across this quote. Although paper clips might not be our first go-to solution for anything, um, 
Using the examples first of the implementation of our new collections management system, and next the example of the overhaul of our research library, Today, I'd like to share with you how MacGyver's spirit of resourcefulness and determination can serve you in overcoming some of the challenges in your archives. Next slide. Uh, I'll begin by describing some of the realities we were faced with in adopting a new collections management system, something that needed to support our workflows, um, but also uh, make our resources accessible with a public facing portal, all on a limited budget. When I arrived uh, at the Military Women's Memorial as a newly minted librarian and archivist in 2020, uh, the organization had a two decades old database, which was unstable. And although the collection had undergone a complete physical inventory with grant funding and support of an outside consultant to establish physical and intellectual control of the collection, I've got a little snapshot of that here in the slide, um, we needed a way to pair the inventory location information with the information in the legacy database. Um, also, I joined the staff during COVID and we had a very minimal uh, web presence at that time. Um, in part because of that reason, there was um, minimal awareness of the collection and it was restricted to on-site visitors, which was particularly problematic during COVID. Due to limited staff time and having only one school trained archivist on staff, we really needed a solution that would be easy to implement with a minimal learning curve. Um, we also had a very limited budget that we had to advocate for to put any system in place. Next slide, please. At first glance, the solution seemed clear to me that we needed to adopt archive space or another open source solution because they're virtually free uh, and membership fees are low for an organization of our size. But then I had to examine more closely our realities. Why not an open source solution? Why not archive space? Well, many of our collection donations are small. Uh, they consist of museum objects and a limited number of papers and images which were not necessarily well suited to the hierarchies that can be created in archive space. Also, our outsourced IT team is configured for office supported PCs, and we have a non-cloud um, storage uh, available to us, a network basically, but we're not really configured for hosting of specialized technologies. We do uh, tend to digitize on demand um, ac according to the needs of researchers and for exhibit planning, but we need a, needed a place where we could co-locate descriptive metadata with our images. And this was not really available through archive space without implementation of a digital asset management system for which we definitely had no budget. Uh, furthermore, our tech support and our staff were not equipped to handle data migration and to integrate data sets from Excel and other platforms together. Uh, I will point out that access to memory and collective access offer the capability to have a public facing portal and the descriptive uh, metadata co-located, um, but they were not really uh, viable options for us, primarily for cost reasons. Next slide, please. Um, instead of going with archive space or a free solution, we opted to uh, select Archivera uh, Lucidia software solution. Um, why Archivera? Um, they provided us um, complete support for our data migration, uh, which was less costly than any of the other options that we explored. Um, Archivera is also a great fit for our collection attributes because we are able to um, describe things um, a little more effectively and not necessarily with the hierarchies um, that um, would be tend to be more archival in nature. Uh, we do have an annual contract with them, um, but overall it's less costly than if we had hired um, a part-time staff member uh, to work on the collection. So the, the solution really supports our functionality uh, with the staff we have in place now. Uh, the software is updated automatically. Um, those updates are included in our subscription and we're able to describe and make visible a range of media formats without a digital asset management system. We have full um, tech support for Archivera if we run into any issues. It also uh, moves us in the direction of um, adopting 
archival descriptive standards, and eventually we'll have the capability of um, creating finding aids in uh, encoded archival description uh, when we're ready for that next step. Uh, it also provides integrated um, research requests where we receive uh, email alerts. And then uh, for the future, we do have uh, a member database, which is rich with biographical data on our service women. Um, we have a configurable API if we decide in the future to do an integration. Um, our vetting process for a new collections management system made it clear that the free solution is not always the best option. Next slide, please. The second example that I'd like to highlight for you is the overhaul of the Military Women's Memorial Research Library. We adopted a low cost online searchable catalog and completed a complete overhaul of our physical space, which you see pictured here in a somewhat uh, a state of disarray as we disassembled and got ready to renew the space. You see the library um, with a lot of sticky notes in it, uh, tags hanging off of books. And these were our classification system, which was improvised by well-meaning volunteers um, years ago. Uh, but we were able to replace that with the support of generous donations of unneeded supplies from other repositories and volunteer support from Team Rubicon. Um, some of their team members are pictured here. Next slide, please. Uh, what were we able to accomplish for under $1,500? Uh, we purchased the supplies that we needed to care for our books. Uh, to protect them, to repair them, to barcode them, and implement a classification system and apply spine labels. Um, we built our library catalog on Library Thing, which is a free, um, free tool available to anyone. You can create a home library with it. Uh, but Tiny Cat is a software that we adopted as our um, discovery layer, and it costs us only $250 a year to have a complete online searchable catalog of our library. We received a donation of free shelving through the generosity of Hillwood Museum and Estates when um, they no longer needed shelving having moved into a new space. I have mentioned previously the um, volunteer assistance from Team Rubicon. We also acquired free archival boxes from the American Institute of Architects, which offered them up to the merit community. And these um, will house the original manuscripts that we have that yet uh, have yet to be cataloged. Finally, we were able to replace our tables and chairs um, with furniture that was no longer needed from a nearby office closure. Next slide, please. Hi, Amy. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but your, your time is up. Okay. So, thank you. Um, basically, here's our catalog, and I'll just move you through the images here. If you just kind of peruse through to the end, and I'll just conclude by saying that um, I'd like to encourage you to... Um, as you try, try to overcome challenges in your archives to, re, um, to keep all options on the table, look for opportunities uh, to work with other repositories, one man's uh, trash is another's treasure. And as Melissa emphasize, will emphasize, look to supplementing staff with volunteer support. Don't get too caught up in the ideal solution, but rather move in the right direction. Thank you and sorry for running over. All right, so um, I hope everybody can hear me and I hope you can see me. <laughs> I can still see Amy, so I'm not sure um, if you can see me, but I'm going to go ahead. So hello, my name is Laura Christensen. I'm the Curator of Manuscripts and Archives at the Thomas Walsh Library in Leesburg, Virginia. A few notes about our repository. Uh, we are a local history and genealogy library that has the unique position of being owned by a town government. So the town of Leesburg is um, a large town um, in Northern Virginia. Um, and in the early 90s, um, the county library system was no longer going to operate our library, which has been in operation since around 1922 in the building that you see pictured here. Um, and it is 
Um, in the 90s, the town was approached when the county decided to no longer operate the, the building, which was then about 70 years old. And the, um, they decided they would take the library over. Um, while the history of our library is as a public library, a general um, circulating library, um, at that time, the library had already been switching to be a special collections library. And we've continued that trend. So um, as we collect local history materials related to Northern Virginia, uh, specifically Loudoun County and Leesburg. And those include everything from um, you know, archival collections, um, rare books, oral histories, as well as books related to local history and genealogy. We do um, continue our history as a public institution, however. So um, we are open to the public seven days a week, and we have both evening hours, and um, we offer free access. There's no membership. You don't have to belong to an institution. And um, so everybody is welcome to come to the library. As of that, access is really one of our key um, motivating factors. So we try to make things as accessible as possible. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about one of those collections. So next slide, please. Um, and that is our oral history collections. We are in a wonderful position in that over the last, um, oh gosh, it's getting to be like 50 years, um, the library has been accruing um, oral and audio collections. So those include among the top and, and, and most used our um, Black History Committee Oral History Project, which was collected between um, 2000 and the present, which has, um, I think, over 100 interviews, um, and also a Loudoun County Oral History Project, which capture a lot of people um, throughout the history of the county, talking about various aspects, everything from civil rights to education to um, daily life. We also have some video-based collections, such as our um, Thomas Balch Library Oral History Collection, which is one where um, the Friends Organization of our library selects somebody in the community to interview every year, and they do a you know full high production video um, of them talking <laughs> for like two hours, and then they do a debut, and it's really quite lovely. Um, in addition to this, we have a radio collection that has about 700 hours of radio content. In the early 2000s, um, we were approached by um, people who were interested in these collections being more accessible. So we tried a lot of different methods to do that. Um, the first step was uh, someone created an access-based index, or rather I should say they started to, um, they never finished it. Uh, we have transcripts for many of the interviews and there was an effort to make sure that transcripts were available for all of the available interviews. Um, so we're in an envi enviable position there. Um, around 2014, a donor approached us and said these should be available and more accessible in your reading room other than, you know, people coming in and you getting out the cassette tape player and putting it on a desk um, and letting it and giving them some earphones. Um, obviously, having people listen to the interviews on the original cassette is also not a great idea. So they provided some funding uh, that allowed us to pursue um, digitizing the collections as they were then, and since then we've managed to continue digitizing everything that is received. Um, however, the challenge then became, how are we going to present this to people? The next slide, please. Um, we approached our IT department because we are part of a town government. We have to go through IT. Scott's comment about um, creating a solution that avoided IT's interaction um, is enviable. Um, I have to, I'm joking in some extent, our IT department usually is very supportive, although we encounter many issues in communicating what our needs are and meeting them um, halfway, so to speak, uh, with, with the solutions that they are willing and able to provide us with. Um, the solution for our oral history um, and making them more accessible in our reading room um, is a good summary of, of this, this sort of ongoing conversation. So at the time, we wanted to use a, a widely available um, oral history uh, software solution like the Ohm solution um, from the um, Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History, um, a platform that is aimed at creating metadata and providing access to oral history interviews. Um, they did not like that because it was open source and open source is, is forbidden. We are not allowed to do anything like that. And we understand that we need to work with them because they have wider 
considerations like protecting important things such as the water system, the airport, et cetera. And that's fine. Um, all, all scale in point. Um, however, they are we're not willing to you know go for something that is less open source either that was maybe more subscription. Um, they also did not really want us to put this content accessible on the web. Um, so we needed an in-library solution. Um, and what we ended up with is a kiosk where there was a touch screen. And um, you could sit down and you can see the screens here. Um, you could browse through individual collections, click, go to um, an interview, and then see the um, audio or video content. Um, however, what was not great about this system, although it did provide in-library access, which was okay, it's better than, you know, the cassette tape maybe, um, was that they wanted us to operate this in a SharePoint system. So just using Microsoft's SharePoint, um, we had to produce files that could um, be uh, accessed evenly within this house, within the SharePoint. Um, and then maintain within SharePoint. So we had to take all of our uh, digitized audio and create video for it using photographs in the background. Um, however, the reason they wanted to use SharePoint was that the town was at that point very invested in using this um, for an um, interweb system for, for housing government documents and things like that. And that was largely based on one person in the IT department who was a huge supporter of it and really wanted it to, to go places. Um, what eventually happened was that person left the town um, and nobody else in the IT department really had the knowledge or interest in supporting the SharePoint system and particularly in doing some of the labor intensive back end work um, that was required to keep this system going. Um, it would disconnect regularly, files would get um, uh, lost in some way, <laughs> I'm not really sure how, and they would only provide limited access to um, administer this software. Um, we worked with the remaining um, IT staff and made some valiant efforts, but eventually it just died. Um, next slide, please. So we're stuck, what do we do? Where can we go? Um, we went down the, in, the same road we went down before, with the IT department and pointing out um, largely available solutions such as, you know, we could do an Omeka instance um, and we had continuing conversations. Um, there had been some change in the IT department um, during this time where they were more willing to embrace cloud solutions, but they were still against open source and they were still in, uh, kind of against like um, um, hosting things uh, elsewhere. Um, they, they, they have some opinions. Um, so we thought, what can we do that's going to work within th their framework, things that um, they already have? What do we have on hand that we can work with? So we thought about it and we're like, one thing about us and the um, uh, government aspect of this is access. We, we want um, transparency and we wanna be able to people to access this. So we looked at what tools they had. And one thing that they had, as you can see here, um, were webcasts. So um, we were town, the town council meetings, um, commission meetings, other things like that were um, made publicly accessible through a, an existing Granicus webcast um, platform. It wasn't ideal. Um, it's really aimed at, here's a recording, here's a recording, um, not doing more complex organizations of data. But you can see it did have features that we wanted. So we could take um, our transcripts, we could take our metadata, and we could make the recordings that we had more browsable. So it was like, aha. How are we gonna make this work? Next slide, please. Um, we had to um, do some um, compromising. Um, we're no longer able to create collections. However, we are able to list content um, in groups of collections. Um, in a trade-off for this, people can now search across our video and audio content. So they will go to a page that's on our website. So we did win there. Um, they can click in the search archives box and they can type in um, a keyword they're interested in, for instance, schools, um, and it'll bring up a list of videos. They'll get, um, they can see immediately if there's a video, an audio recording or a transcript. And then they will also um, be able to see the recording and read the transcript as they go. Um, and I think I have one more slide. I do. 
Um, in addition to the um, wonderful platform that we're going to have available, um, we do now also have a backup. So we have a past perfect online instance that we can use the pinch to present this material. We don't want to, but we're, we're, we realized we needed to have a backup plan in hand. And also in, in the um, next three months, we are launching our own online catalog that will include our oral history um, recordings um, that will link to these recordings online. So people will be able to discover the recordings through another um, solution. So we've, we've um, learned a couple things, work with what you have, and also always have a backup plan. So thank you very much. Melissa, I can see you. You just need to unmute. There. It took a minute to get here. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Melissa Davis. I'm the Director of Library and Archives at the George C. Marshall Foundation. And I am a loan arranger, so I'm going to be talking about MacGyvering a Workforce or Volunteers in the Archives. Um, next slide, please. Um, the George C. Marshall Foundation was formed by President Truman uh, before he left office. The building is in Lexington, Virginia. We are a 501c3, but we're surrounded by the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, the collections here and the library books here are related to Marshall and time and place. And of course, the flagship collection are the 50-year career Marshall papers. Next slide, please. Uh, 20 years ago, we had five full-time people in the library. Now I'm alone, so I have too much to do. Um, I have languishing projects and such as partially scanned photo collections and a tremendous backlog, as you see in this picture. Uh, so I get volunteers. And I have had really good luck with getting volunteers. You have to go out and find your volunteers. They don't always come knocking on your door. I've had really good luck with homeschool groups, with high school students, um, National Honor Society students who have a, a service requirement, um, with internship students from local colleges. And then the greatest majority of my volunteers come from a local retirement community. So those are some places where you can look for volunteers. Um, I do have more volunteers during the school year because the greatest majority of mine are students or retired folks. Uh, and that works out well for my organization because in the summertime, uh, it is prime research season and I'm very busy with researchers. So I have fewer volunteers than in the summertime, but you have to decide what works for you. Uh, next slide, please. You should definitely interview your volunteers, discover their interests, what their past work and volunteer experience has been. Maybe have a list of projects that you have ongoing because they may not know what you're doing um, and what they would find interesting. The projects absolutely must be flexible uh, with open-ended completion dates for volunteers to, to successfully work on them, which allows for people to take vacations and go to graduations and things like that. Um, you might decide that you want to have a contract for students who are fulfilling service hours for a requirement at school. Uh, I, I found that that works very well and it also gives them something to turn in at the completion of their volunteer time. Um, please don't be discouraged if a volunteer doesn't work out uh, or, or if a volunteer leaves. Uh, MacGyver never quit when he had a problem, so you don't quit either. Uh, look instead at what's been accomplished um, and, and what the volunteer was able to do to move a project forward. Uh, this is a picture of my volunteer, Carol. He's from the local retirement community and he single-handedly uh, completely reset the library here and said he thoroughly enjoyed doing it. Next slide, please. Training is time but volunteers are force multipliers. So you should welcome and encourage questions. You should be patient when the same question is asked more than one time. Remember your first archival experience and all that you didn't know and all that you needed to learn. 
Um, this is via my cadet Noah. He was my volunteer, my intern. Last summer, he had no experience when he came to me working in an archive, and he spent the summer working with some of my problem accessions and solving issues. Next slide, please. You should definitely make your volunteers part of the team. Talk about programming and educational efforts that are going on in your organization. Invite them to programs at no charge. Um, definitely appreciate them, and food is always good. Uh, this is my volunteer team at our, our uh, organization Christmas party last year, and I think they had a good time. Next slide, please. Ask your volunteers to be thinkers when they're working. Um, sometimes they will come up with great ideas for improving efficiency or completion time on a project. They might even have ideas for new projects that you hadn't thought of. Um, these are three elders in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They usually come in pairs, but we had three for a while, and they were scanning photo collection with metadata on the back of the photo. And so the, the three guys said, you know, scanning is the simple, quick part. The metadata takes time. Do you have another laptop? And so they had one elder scanning and two elders transcribing the information, and they got a huge amount done in a short amount of time. And I was grateful for their thinking on this project. Next slide, please. Um, with guidance, have your volunteers do a social media takeover day. Let them show what they're doing, uh, talk about who they are and how they found the organization, um, why they think what they're doing is valuable. Um, Ask for blog contributions about their activities and the collections that they're working with. And, and with their permission, you know, include your volunteers in open houses, include them in library and archive tours, even in videos that you might make in your library and archive. This is my intern, and some of you might remember um, my daughter, Erin, who presented with me last year. Uh, she's a library science student then, now graduated. Uh, she wrote a blog on a collection that she was accessioning that was from a dual military couple in World War II and how they maintained their love affair through letters. Um, and it was a wonderful, wonderful blog. So allow your volunteers to contribute to you. Next slide, please. Um, amazing things will happen if you give your volunteers the training and the permission to do the things that need to be done. We have here a before and after picture of a section of my main archive floor. You can see the mess of before and the things piled on the floor even, on the cart, on the shelving, and then the after, which is so much better. Um, and for me, I had to MacGyver a, a storage situation for all the empty library carts that we were coming up with. Uh, next slide, please. I appreciate everyone for joining us today. I hope that you've enjoyed our presentations and that you've learned something. And we'll now turn to our helpers and answering some questions. Thank you all for your presentation. We appreciate it so much. So we're gonna start with the Q&A that's in the chat. If you have a question, go ahead and put it in there or you can raise your hand and we will call on you after we do that. But right now, looks like we have five questions. Our first is for Tara. What system is the digital archive in? Um, so we are using a DSpace space platform. So very old school, um, but we're hosted by Atmire, which is a company that hosts this particular platform. Um, I unfortunately don't know a lot of the details of like our, how we got to admire how we got to DSpace because it was in existence when I started. I can certainly get you the information of the um, librarian actually who, who helped to make the decision to go that direction for me to do that. So I'm going to actually insert everybody's contact information in the chat. Feel free to send me an email um, and I will get you in contact with my colleague who can tell you so much more. Great. Thank you, Tara. Our next question is for Scott. Can Scott talk about the kinds of research requests they get and, <clears throat> excuse me, and if they see their improvements on digital preservation steps helping them serve up e-records? So, um, 
our researchers, you know, in a lot of ways, religious archives are a strange mix of public and of, of public archive and private corporation. Um, so we get a lot of internal requests, council communications. Um, the museum certainly does uh, a number of questions, um, but we also get academic and genealogy requests. Um, the most common question we get is my aunt slash great aunt was a sister. Do you have any pictures of her? Um, in terms of e-requests, I will say that the more recently produced e-records are not the most requested materials yet. We've had a few you know, sisters ask about, do you have this past issue of the, the sister newsletter that's all digital? And we'll say yes. Um, the big, big outside requests that we've been able to use, the more modern e-records are actually related to what the sisters did during COVID. Um, and so those are usually, you know, they're born digital news clippings um, or things like podcasts that otherwise were not in our catalog yet. And so having a place to go for those, um, that's really the big topic that's been most helpful so far. Um, even if they're not the, the, even if the more recent materials are not the most research requests right now, at some point they will be. Thank you, Scott. It looks like our next two questions are for Amy. Uh, the first is what software supports the virtual tour on the Women's Memorial website? It is excellent. Yeah. I will have to research the answer to that question for you because I wasn't responsible for creating that video. Um, but if you send me your contact info or reach out directly, I'll make sure I get an answer from our marketing team. Great. And then the next question for Amy, how did you connect with the other institutions and organizations that donated supplies and volunteer labor? Um, I attribute a lot of that to Merrick, to be honest, um, just being on the, um, the list for the Virginia caucus, for the Maryland and DC caucus, since we sit in Northern Virginia, but right on the edge of DC, I get all of those. So um, I had a chance to tour the new archive storage space at Hillwood Museum, and they were talking about their old facility, and I saw the shelving there, and so I just asked the question, what's, what's the uh, disposition and disposition plan for those shelves, and it turned out they weren't needed, um, which was a tremendous help to us. We never could have afforded to purchase those shelves. Um, likewise, uh, Nancy from AIA uh, put a call out saying, I have lots of archival storage boxes available. We're, we're closing our offices for two years of renovations. Um, if you'd like to come pick them up, let me know. And so um, we spent a couple days going over there, acquiring the boxes, and they were gen generous enough to donate two small exhibit cases to us as well. Um, so just kind of uh, keeping eyes and ears open uh, for opportunities just to connect with other institutions um, because we always have something to learn from each other and oftentimes um, we, can, we can support each other um, in ways that are unexpected. With Team Rubicon, um, they have supported previous efforts at the Military Women's Memorial. Um, some of our event planning requires a lot of setup like for honor flights and things like that. And then we did have a closure for renovation of the back office space of the memorial a couple of years ago, and they were instrumental in moving all of our furniture and things out at that time. So I just reconnected with them and asked if they would be able to support this project because we didn't really have the, the staff to install the new shelves, especially with that kind of construction background to ensure they were properly secured to the walls. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. uh, our next question is for Melissa. Did you ever experience resistance from your admin team or your boss when wanting to include volunteers in events or doing volunteer recognition? Absolutely not. They've been abs they have been thrilled with what we've been able to accomplish here. Um, I think they're kind of relieved because I don't spend a lot of time jonesing for part-time help if I have great volunteers. So maybe it takes budget pressure off of them a little, but they have completely supported me in having volunteers join us at functions and having them come to um, um, uh, op education opportunities, programming. In fact, we're planning a staff day later this spring 
And uh, I have been given permission to include my volunteers if they wish to join us. Uh, so it's really been a lot of support from the organization. I know that maybe not everyone would have that. Obviously, I'm not working with classified material here or things that, that would, would be problematic for having volunteers. I know that some organizations just disallow volunteers and I feel sorry for them, um, but I've been very lucky. Great. Um, this next question is for all of our panelists. And that is, how do you balance theory versus practice versus local practice? Crickets. <laughs> the, um, oh. This is a line that I've said a couple times in this group meeting around is that um, in theory, theory and practice are the same thing. In practice, they ain't. Um, and so the fact is that theory, theory is always going to break down in practice. Um, and you, you need to figure out, you know, that's, that's the science part of archival science is figuring out how the best way to make sure that the theory can actually apply to you or that fits your local condition. Um, we try and take the theories, at least here, and, and make them useful. Um, and sometimes we need to plan our own path. Um, oh, and sorry, just one quick thing. Sorry. I, that's okay. I was chatting, like somebody made a comment while after I was done presenting. And, you know, for me, it's one of those things like in the end, as long as these materials are being made accessible, I sleep well at night. I mean, because they weren't before. Um, people couldn't access them. They didn't know what we had. They were in those awful boxes. So while it may not be the best archival point, it's good enough for now. And people are using them. And I'm getting more resources as well. So I'm doing my job is, I think, how I look at it. And Anne, please, we've cut you off twice now. No, it's fine. Uh, definitely progress at perfection. Um, in my, if you are like me, kind of a subset of something and you're not an archive, um, explaining the like zero to the four, explaining an if thens. If this is the limitation, then this is going to be the effect on the archive on the, um, and really just making sure that your institution knows if we are not going to meet this perfect um, thing, then this is going to be the um, this is going to be the reality of how the archive is and just making that very clear of basically consequences and just having that all out if that if that makes any sense of um, yeah. I think also we have to stop apologizing. Really. Um, we are who we are and we have what we have to work with. Um, and we have to figure out the best way. It's good to know best practices, but don't lose sleep over them because I would say the majority of archivists are not able to do best practices from lack of time and money um, and personnel. And so it's nice to know that for those of us who've been doing more product, less processing for a long time, that there's actually a name for that. Um, and so don't, don't apologize. Feel good about what you're accomplishing. Um, always take pictures before you embark on a big project so you can look back at what a mess it was and how much you've accomplished and dwell on the good and rather than the undone so you don't make yourself nuts and burn out. Just to echo that, um, always, always document your progress, um, even if it's not the progress you want, because it's, it's great to go later and also make that argument that look how far we've come and we could also do this if you'll give us more money and funding and staff and et cetera. Okay, great, thank you all. Um, Scott, where can I learn more about the scale you were using to judge the state of the archive from 2020 to 2023? NDSA, preservation levels, mm -hmm. no idea what that stands for. National Digital Stewardship Alliance, does that sound right? Yeah, I think so. 
Um, okay, another one for Scott. How did you collaborate with creators of digital objects slash assets to get them donated or transferred to the archive? Did you need to get a mandate or support for a digital archive with your leadership first and then approach creators, including department heads? That one's you know, in the chat. That's kind of a long one. <laughs> yeah. So there's, I was thinking, there's pluses and minuses to um, having a rotating leadership and plus and minuses to having a leadership that doesn't quite know what you do. Um, it's the pluses are you can kind of, as long as you don't spend exorbitant amounts of money, get some room to innovate uh, and work within your field. Um, and the minuses are you constantly have to explain what you do. Um, it's very beneficial that we've had predecessors who took the first steps of explaining to generations of council and board members that digital documents are documents, even if they didn't take the next steps of um, really setting up a preservation plan for them. Um, so thankfully, the groundwork for transferring documents uh, at the end of board terms and council terms, which are either three or six years, um, was already very much in place. Um, other departments, you know, communications constantly has events and constantly has sets of photos. They're easy to work with and say, you know, drop us, add us to the list of things when this gets shared around and make sure that archives is on here and we have a set place and a set person that that goes to. Um, other departments, we still have more difficulty talking with and we're working on it. Great. And I, I want to apologize to Caitlin Legacy Rolston. I accidentally skipped over you. So your question is for the whole group. And Caitlin says, I find the topics you all discussed today are faced by many institutions, but it can be challenging to find others to reach out to discuss these issues. Is there a professional, social media, or another form of group besides MARAC that you all would recommend to stay in contact and problem solve with other MacGyvering institutions? And I see a hand raised. Scott. <laughs> I'll do a hand of uh, put in a plug for Small Museum Association, SMA. Um, yes, sometimes they're a little bit more in the curatorial and museum field, but they're small institutions who are making the most out of their budgets, just like so many members of MARAC. Um, they're the ones MacGyvering the most. They're not massive, giant, well-funded institutions. All right. Uh, this is for Scott et al., uh, what is the structure of adding current documents coming into your archive? I work in an independent school where individuals decide what to keep and where, and this is specific to electrically born documents and photos. Uh, I'm scrolling up to read that again, just for a moment here. Yeah, that one's in the chat. I see it. I see Joanna, it. or Joanna, sorry. Um, we're trying to, you know, get better than our predecessors on doing things like making accession records, even for born digital documents. Um, you know, we don't log every single, even if we're not logging every single file, you know, if it's, you know, treasurer's documents 2018 to 2021, um, if we can have a record of that that says, you know, this folder of digital stuff came in and it's 30 Excel files, something like that. Um, the, those informal positions, we tend to try and brief early and brief often to maintain records and turn them over at the end of their term or time in office or, um, you know, you, re, the clean the clean out the desk times. Unless it's a, a yearly routine thing, the clean out the desk times are when we can really hit people up. Um, I'm not saying that's a perfect system, but at least in our organization, that seems to work the best. I think also um, to make sure that you're still creating the same kind of records that you would for for hard copy things. Um, one of the frustrations I had when I got here is that things that came in as born digital items didn't have collection guides. Um, and so that was something that that we had to go back and create so that those collections were usable. If I didn't know what was in them, I couldn't recommend them to a researcher. Um, so I think that as you get those born digital items, make sure you're creating the same finding aids that you would for the hard copy so that they don't get stuck on a server and forgotten. I 
think that takes us to time. Um, thank you all so much for your presentations, your engagement, your questions. Um, there have been uh, several direct questions about recording, slide availability, et cetera, and that will be happening through the Merrick repository, the drum, and more information will be coming out um, after the conference is over. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your sessions. <laughs>